Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to day four, episode four of our February webinar series about getting ahead of the growth opportunity in China. If you are new to the webinar series this week or you haven't seen the other sessions and episodes, then basically what I'm trying to get at with this whole webinar series is that if you want to get ahead of that growth opportunity, you need to be able to prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for all different types of scenarios, business models, initiatives that you want to take on in order to be able to get into the Chinese market and then scale up in the Chinese market. So preparation is key and is fundamental for all the topics we're talking about this week. Now, just very briefly on how the webinar works. Again, if you're watching this live or on replay, just to let you know, we're here to educate. We're here to teach you on mistakes we've made for the last 18 years. And hopefully you'll learn something from it. Now, if you've got any questions, it's the first come first serve principle, insert them into the chat box. This is gonna be 60 minutes of your time spent, so please do use it wisely. Um, and just remember, there is no dumb question when it comes to China. We're using Zoom meetings. If you run into technical problems, just know that it takes, um, my recommendation is that you should log off, log back in and see if that works. If it doesn't, know that we are recording today's session. From my perspective, if we run into any difficulties, <clears throat> it usually takes about 60 seconds to two minutes for me to reboot the system, but I will be coming back on to finish today's presentation. <clears throat> the webinar is for you. If you are a newbie to China, which basically means you found opportunities in the Chinese market and you're looking to gain a certain level of China education on how to enter the market. Um, and again, you're looking to prepare yourself for this entry into the China market. Uh, if you're a newbie, let me know. Type that into the chat box. If you're a startup in China, it basically means in my, my mind, it just, we define it as companies or individuals that have been transacting with China for a period of one to three years, they've hit certain trigger points, certain um, volume of transactions, value of transactions, and now they're trying to understand whether it makes sense to have an on the ground strategy, as well as a headcount um, in terms of uh, moving forward and scaling up. So if you can let me know in the chat box, are you a newbie or are you a startup in China? Please do let us know. The webinar series for this month is all about preparing yourself in different aspects of your business prior to actually doing market entry. It's understanding the fundamentals behind uh, protecting your IP, incorporating an entity, communicating with your finance team, recruiting those first hires, and choosing the right decision makers in your corporate management that will lead you along the path to success. So again, it's really doing a lot of the homework that has to happen prior to doing any form of business in China. Now your China expert for the week is myself for the Lost Voice, apologies. My name is Christina kohler Kaluchi. I'm head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. I have close to 18 years of corporate services and compliance experience in China. Um, we have helped over 500 companies with their market entry strategy, with their market entry strategy, their implementation, and the most fun part is the scaling up in the market as well. We are also um, creators of a variety of different methodologies, which we are explaining in this week's series um, about saving your brand China Incorporation Blueprint, communicating with your accountants, choosing the right people, those first hires for organization, and then choosing the right corporate management as well. If you haven't received a copy of our ebook, we have a free ebook that we're distributing to people who are interested in getting into China. It's called The 10 Biggest Mistakes Companies Make in China. This is the 10 biggest mistakes I personally have also made in China. So it really comes from personal experience. Um, and if you'd like to have a free copy of that, then just email me at christina at woodburnglobal.com. It's a great short read and gives you a lot of insight to some of the most common mistakes that foreign leaders make going into the Chinese market. 
So let's get cracking on today's episode, which is about how to recruit and employ your first hires in China. So this topic is really geared towards companies, entrepreneurs that are that have been transacting in China um, or feel that they can only transact if they have somebody on the ground. They may not necessarily be prepared or committed yet to establishing an entity in China. And as a consequence, it's finding out how to find people, how to handle interviews from abroad right now under COVID times, and it's how to actually employ those first hires in China without actually having a presence on the ground. Obviously, if you have a presence on the ground and you're going the legitimate route, um, then you have a legal entity to hire people. We can, we'll also touch on that a little bit in, the, in today's presentation. So I always starting all of these presentations this week on what are the pain points from foreign investors' point of view in terms of having those first hires, okay? So first of all, currently under COVID times, you have these first hires that are on the ground. You're not there. There are border controls that are preventing you from going abroad and doing a proper face-to-face -face onboarding. And also send it to you because they'll have difficulties going back into China. So we're really stuck at both ends of the spectrum in various jurisdictions, trying to get these people on board. And a lot of this is the point of view of the employee and the point of view of the company in that there's a lack of transparency between both. There potentially is a language barrier or cultural barrier to um, which does not help with misunderstandings. There may be a lack of communication because of time zone issues. There may be the issue that you don't want to spend so much money because you're already spending money on the salary. So you're limiting the spending on the actual activities that this employee is going to be doing, ultimately leading to a lack of quality in the service that these employees are actually going to be providing you. There may be a lack of trust, again, on both sides, because there's a lack of transparency, a lack of communication. And since these are brand new employees, you can't expect loyalty to start from day one. Loyalty is earned over time. So you're running into all of these emotional issues that will stem both from you as the employer. And you have to imagine it's also going to stem from the employee who also have a lack of trust in you or a lack of loyalty kind of follow what their action plan will be as they are starting off their first three months, six months in market and working full time for you. The most important thing you have to remember is that the first hires are your vital hires. They are the ones that are going to create the sound foundation that you need to be able to scale up your business, to be able to hit your KPIs and your goals and your objectives. So the big question obviously is, how do you spot the good ones? Because what we want to try and avoid in China is the high turnover rates of employees. And I can tell you, I'll just go back a slide, the high turnover rates really are because of these six reasons. The lack of transparency, the lack of understanding and language capabilities, the lack of communication, spending more money on less quality, lack of trust, lack of loyalty, all right? So how do you spot a good hire? How do you spot a good potential employee, all right? So I've defined people into four different categories. <clears throat> and Ultimately, you want to find somebody who has all of these categories within them, within them. So let me explain. You have to imagine you're going into the Chinese market. You have a to-do list that is complex because you're starting everything from scratch. You have to remember, you are a startup in China. Everything is going to be pretty damn new and everything has to fall on the shoulders of this new employee. So you want them to be generalists. And what do I mean by generalists? It means that this first hire has to be flexible enough to do multiple functions, all right? Um, you might have hired them because of their sales skills, but you also maybe need them to be an administrator. You may need them to have an understanding on finances. 
you may need to them to have an under on um, I don't know supply chain and logistics. So they need to know a little bit about everything, okay? And they need to be flexible enough in their mentalities to realize that they're going to have to get their hands full um, in certain jobs and responsibilities that maybe they didn't anticipate they would have to do. The next is having no egos. Now you might want to find managerial person, either in BD, sales, marketing, whatever it might be. Generally, people who have 10 years or more of experience, they do have a certain ego level where they say, you know, I've grown up with the ranks. I'm now not going to get my hands dirty because I've done that already and I'm not prepared to do it again. What we want is people with no egos. We want people who are, have, are, are developed the same vision as you in order to be able to scale up in the market. And they're willing to get their hands dirty initially in order to be able to scale up. The next is the believers. The believers are those that believe in your vision. And if you don't share your vision with them, how are they going to believe in you, gain trust, gain loyalty to stay with you for the long term? So you've got to make sure that you share your vision, share your goals and objectives, the timeline for these goals and objectives and turn them into believers that this company is going to achieve something great, all right? And then you want somebody with grit and tenacity, somebody who's, gonna, who's, who's a go-getter, who's gonna go out there and really fight for you, broker those deals and negotiate, and make sure that you hit those revenue targets that you're looking for. So it's really a combination of these four characteristics that you're looking in these first hires. Because like I said, you're a startup in China. You're not going to build a team of 10 people from day one. You're going to hire one person who does everything. Then you might hire a PA, personal assistant, or second person who's also going to then become a part of that team. And then you know, the first hire will start, start delegating. But you still need these two people to be flexible enough to do a little bit of everything. All right. And we want to avoid those that have egos and feel like they're better than anybody else. We really want those people who believe in the vision and are going to fight for that vision. So how to find the right talent in China? Where are these people sitting? So there are a lot of ways of finding potential candidates in China. The easiest way is through the job search roles, like 51job.com, chinahr.com, Pin, China Job. And the issue though with these job search portals is the fact that you need a Chinese entity to be able to subscribe to them. So you have to show a copy of your business license and you have to sign up under your Chinese entity's name in order to be able to log in, get an account and start doing your candidate searches. This might not be an option for many of you that are not yet prepared to set up an entity in China. The second option is LinkedIn. Now LinkedIn is not blocked in China thus far. There are rumors that it might get blocked eventually, but right now it's Still, there's still a lot of Chinese individuals that have profiles on LinkedIn. So you can very easily do searches, particularly for experienced individuals, so managerial positions on LinkedIn. Don't underestimate that form of search. You'll also have social media platforms like eChat, where you can connect with people and contact them to see if they would be interested in the job. And then obviously, last but not least, something that you'd have to pay for, and then you'd have to look in your budget whether you have the financial capital capabilities to pay for it, is working with recruiters and headhunters who are on the ground and already have that ecosystem and network of people that can find you candidates. But initially what you could do is point two and point three, which is looking on LinkedIn and then also looking on the social media platforms like WeChat. Now, Again, getting ahead of the growth opportunity. My spiel is, is that you have to do homework and you need to do preparatory work, preparation. And a lot of times you should be doing this on your own. So do your research, study salary guidelines in China, understand what the average salary levels are, understand the types of titles that exist. Titles mean a lot in China. Understand work experience levels, education levels, et cetera. Do your homework. Now, where can you find study salary guidelines? Where can you find salary guidelines for China? Google it. China salary guidelines, and you will have a whole series of headhunters who provide 
free salary guidelines that are up to date. They usually do them quarter by quarter where you then can get the latest salary levels, particularly for the tier one cities, which are Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. But you should be doing that homework. Obviously, if you're outsourcing to recruiters or headhunters, they're going to give you their opinion on what average salary levels are. I think it's always good that you do your own homework as well so that you have the ability to create a budget, understand how you want to pay salaries, whether you want to pay commissions, whether you're going to have bonuses, whether the salaries will be based on a 12-month, 13-month, 14-month um, time frame. Okay? And ultimately, do your homework by jotting down on a piece of paper what the actual responsibilities will be for these individuals. Remember, these first hires are critical to your business. You want a turnover of staff with them because you want them to be long-term individuals that are gonna help you scale up, grow, where you know, they're taking the lead for the business. But if you are not clear already in the search phase of candidates and in the interview phase of knowing exactly what these individuals are gonna be doing as a job responsibility, you're not gonna get it very far. You have to make sure that you are educating them on your expectations about what they are going to be doing in the market, okay? So jot down what their roles, what their responsibilities are and go into detail, okay? This is also gonna help you to develop KPIs. It's gonna help you to then track whether they deserve a bonus or not based on the fulfillment of what their responsibilities and roles are, okay? A lot of candidates will leave within the probation period because it has not been clearly explained to them in the interview process what exactly is their job function. And if they've got egos, trust me, they're not going to be doing the dirty work. And if you don't explain that dirty work to them from day one of the interview, you're going to lose them. And you've got to make sure that you're explaining exactly what your expectations are. Now, how to pick the right talent in China can also be tricky, particularly with the fact that nobody can really fly over to China and do face-to-face -face interviews. So a lot is going to be through video conferencing. So how do you find the right candidate? Okay. Resumes are provided by candidates. <clears throat> you can also look at their profiles on LinkedIn and social media. I would take everything with a pinch of salt and verify all that content during the interview. Okay. And for senior management roles, you may even want to have background checks done so that you are truly aware of who you're hiring, okay? Now, I know this will cost money initially to do these types of background checks. It's not a fortune that you're spending on this, but it may prevent issues, obstacles, roadblocks along the way if one, you terminate them, or two, they resign from you, okay? So you need to be sure that you do these types of reviews on them. Then when you're doing the video conferencing interview, Observe their demeanor. Are they shy? Are they brash? Are they harsh? Do they ask a lot of questions about your company? Do they show interest in your company? Remember, you may need to convince them to work for you. We're not living in a time 20 years ago, 18 years ago, where, company, where employees were filing out the door, ready to work for a foreign investor. Now, individuals are very careful about who they want their employers to be. So in many instances, it's you convincing them, why should they work for you, right? Why should they, right? What, what are you incentivizing them with? So understand their demeanor already in the video conference call. Understand their interest level. Do they ask questions? Um, and obviously, don't hesitate to ask questions back. Now, if you feel within the first 10 minutes that there's no real synergy between the two of you or the conversation is very slow and not really progressing. It's not a two-way conversation. By all means, end the interview within 10 minutes. There's no point in continuing that conversation. Okay? So don't be shy in doing that. Don't waste your time either. Now, when we recruit fi finance roles, <laughs> what we do is we screen candidates based on their aptitude. So... What is their skill set technically? We look at their attitude. 
Um, do they have ego? Are they believers? Do they have grit and tenacity? Are they generalists? You know, what's their attitude towards all of that? And then we also look at their language capabilities, particularly if they say they're bilingual or trilingual, we do test on that, all right? Because you want to test them not only in spoken oral capabilities, but also in writing. In terms of aptitude, again, it comes down with taking a piece of paper and jotting down the goal and the risk for these individuals. So if it's a technical role, like an accountant or finance manager, you need to have a checklist of what you want to test in terms of skill set. Do they have experience with VAT? Do they have experience with issuing AT invoices? Do they have experience with um, negotiating with tax officers? In which bureaus in Shanghai have they worked with in terms of communicating with tax officers? Um, have they ever worked with customs? When they are working as a finance manager, what is their ecosystem? Who are they communicating with in terms of the different departments? What are their communication skills like? Um, do they have issues communicating with foreign investors? Are there language barriers that cause misunderstandings, particularly from a technical point of view? So these are just you know, questions that are raised that we put on our checklist in regards to the aptitude. In terms of attitude, this is, this is a tricky thing, okay? But you may want to use different interview techniques to see how candidates respond. And you may want to do this over a series of video interviews, not doing them all in one video, video, um, video interview, video conference. So I start off simply by talking about family. I think it's really important to understand the family dynamic do they have children? Are they married? Do their grandparents, or sorry, their parents live with them? Do their grandparents live with them? Who are they supporting? Um, where is their huko, i.e. their residency? Is it in the city that you want them to be located in or is it somewhere else? Um, and we talk a little bit about hobbies, right? This doesn't have to be more than five, 10 minutes, but it just gives an understanding about their personal background. Then we go into university and educational background. You know, how far have they gone up in the educational system and whatnot? Now, a lot of employ a lot of candidates are sometimes surprised by my technique that I start off with a personal. Because a lot of the time companies are so fixated on focusing on skill set, job, et cetera, nobody looks at the personal side of it. And normally that loosens candidates up to then being able to be free to talk about their skill set and whatnot. You want to start a two-way conversation. You got to make them feel comfortable as well, all right? Um, and then obviously you move on to their skill set. You talk about possible scenarios that might pop up and how would they react. And if these candidates, you like them and they move up into the, let's say the last three candidates, do a test, right? Ask them to prepare a presentation on what would they do in the first 90 days working for you? What would be their action plan list? What would they need from you? And what would they actually initiate as an action plan? First of all, it looks at their presentation skills, which I think are vital, particularly as you can't see people face-to-face -face anymore. So they're gonna be presenting a lot of data to you over PowerPoint. The next thing is it, it, share, it shows their thought process, their thinking process. Some people, some candidates might not even take this step seriously. I would completely then remove them out because it's a lack of respect towards your company. It right? shows a lack of interest. Others might really make beautiful presentations, give you ideas, but also show you the interest level that they have and their thought thinking process about how they're gonna work with you and whether that fits within your company's philosophy, whether it is a synergy between you and them in terms of how to move the company forward. So definitely think about the in the interview phases, looking at the aptitude, the attitude, and the language capabilities. Now, on the last slide, I already was asking or, or, or explaining a lot of the questions we would raise, right? But if, for example, you're looking at operations manager, some questions I would ask would be, how big was the team you had last worked with? What were the difficulties you had to face? How did you manage those difficulties? What were the solutions that you created? What in your world is an ideal operation management team? 
How do you solve a problem that arises? How do you act on it? Do you pause? Do you think? Do you act immediately? These are kind of the things we're trying to search whether they do that or not. And then ultimately, we're also looking at their skill set. So what skill set do you have that makes you successful? What skill sets do you feel like you don't have that require possibly additional training? Um, again, that throws them off because you know, they probably never thought, okay, what am I lacking and where do I need to actually grow? And wow, this person is thinking of giving me training, which maybe some candidates need. You know, they could be fantastic, but you have to offer them certain trainings to fit in terms of what your, your, your goals are going to be for the company. And ultimately, you can ask them to describe their management style. So what is their management style? How do they interact with internal teams? How do they interact with external teams? So again, if you're looking at an operations manager, they will be very internally oriented. How do they manage the team underneath them? What teams are usually underneath them? What is their philosophy about management? Um, and then ultimately, something I didn't add here is, you know, have they had difficulties working with foreign um, counterparts or foreign managers? How did they solve that? Have they had cultural issues, that they had language issues. Again, these are all things that just helps to understand how they work on a day-to-day -day basis and how they manage themselves um, <clears throat> with, uh, with a foreign invested company. So here are a couple more questions as well, but I think you get the gist of where I'm getting at. When you're interviewing, it really needs to be a two-way conversation, all right? Uh, where you're sharing ideas, but you're also trying to understand. And again, if you don't get that two-way conversation, end the interview straight away. No point in continuing. Um, and like I said earlier, as candidates scale up into, let's say, your last three, last five, then something I do with everybody that I hire is I ask them to do a project for me. And I basically say, I want you to create a presentation you're going to present to me and my right-hand person um, where you are going to explain to us what your action plan is going to be within the first three to six months of joining my company. I want you to highlight what you need from me and what you're going to do to get the ball rolling and achieve XYZ KPIs. Now, you might have other tests that you want them to, to do. So, for example, um, if you need them to understand SAP, you might ask them to do an SAP test so you have an understanding of their knowledge level on SAP. These tests and these projects could vary. Just make sure you give them a test and project to do, that you can see what their thinking capabilities are and their thought capabilities are, um, and whether they're a good fit for your organization. This will really be the test as to whether they're a good fit or not. Now, just a couple of tips on how to choose those final candidates, because you know, you're going to end up with maybe two, three, four, five top candidates. Um, and how I, and again, a lot of this is about what I do and what I've learned over the last 18 years in terms of interviewing candidates. You've also got to imagine, I interview a lot of accountants and accountants in general are very reactive individuals who are non-sociable. So getting a conversation that's a two-way street, like pulling teeth. Um, but I always have to remind myself, right? Why am I hiring a person? It's understanding what my objectives are for the next 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, right? What are those objectives? What needs to get done? What milestones need to be achieved, okay? What then will this person have to do to achieve those key objectives, okay? Um, you want to also, in the last three, four, five candidates, get at least two or three where you're gonna go into final negotiations with, both, with those candidates. Why? Because you will find candidates do change their minds at the last minute and then start asking for extras, particularly in the nego negotiation phases. And you always want to have a backup and then happens. Now, the issue here is that you should never tell a candidate that actually you've already found the one, but you haven't signed a contract yet. You will only inform candidates that you've signed contracts and potentially done one month of work 
um, because you want to have a backup. And you've gone through all of that work of having this top five. You've probably rated them one to five. You've given the job to the first one, but after you know, going through the negotiations, they start asking for more, it becomes a headache. They start starting the onboarding of the job and they're just a pain in the butt. You know, at that point, you'll say, thank you very much. You get rid of them and you go to candidate number two, okay? You don't want to lose the work that's been done in the interviewing process and all of that. And, you know, people never want to be second choice. You never should tell them that they are second choice. So make sure you're careful on the timing of releasing your backup candidates. At the end of the day, you have to analyze your cost benefit ratio, okay? So if they continuously ask for more, for more, for more, and there's no real return on investment from them, what's the point of keeping them? You're spending more than you should on a candidate without getting anything in return to cover their cost, okay? So again, this is why I say, Preparation is key, understanding what average salary guidelines are for the roles you're looking for, looking at a variety of different headhunters who offer these types of salary guidelines to make a comparison, and understanding, number one, can you afford those salary levels? And number two, if candidates start asking for more, for more, for more, and you're giving it, be prepared that if there's no return on investment in a very quick period of time, you have to let them go, otherwise you can't afford them right? You're going to have a sinking ship. And I just want to say that all of this has come from personal experience. We're in the first five years of operating in China. I didn't check salary guidelines. I just went with whatever they were offering me. I didn't check skill sets because I didn't know how to. I didn't actually ask somebody to validate those skill sets to make sure they were real and true. So don't hesitate also to ask certain experts to help validate candidates for you, to really understand whether they know what they're talking about, especially if it's for technical roles. So engineering roles, finance roles, et cetera. You've got to be very, very aware of that. Um, and next, I want to talk about nine critical issues in the Chinese labor and employment law that will help you to understand how to actually employ people. So, you know, we've gone through the whole phase of what type of characteristics do you want as you're starting up in China? Okay, you want to have general. Do the dirty work to actually build up the business and move forward in the business. Um, you're finding these candidates on a variety of different platforms, social media sites, LinkedIn, or you're actually going through headhunters and recruiters to be able to find them. Then you're doing the interview process. So what questions do you analytically want to ask them? How do you want to get to know them? How do you want to move forward with them? Right? And then you've got your top five candidates. You're giving offers to maybe candidate one, candidate two, and seeing how things progress. And you've got a Backup plan, backup plan with three other candidates as well. Now you've chosen one and they've signed a letter, a letter, offer letter, and they're signing the employment contract. But how are you hiring them? Where is this employment contract and this offer letter coming from? And this is how we're going to start talking about how to actually employ these people. So the first question that always gets asked, can you hire in China without a legal presence? No. Companies have to have a local legal corporate presence within China to be able to hire employees. Now, the question arises then, well, but can you just confirm, so we cannot hire them from the home jurisdiction? No, not legally. If you have a UK company, Swiss company, German company, naturally from that location, you can hire anybody globally. The issue is, what is going to be the labor law in that jurisdiction, i.e. China, that may impact your HQ? China regulations dictate that you cannot hire Chinese individuals that are residing in China from your head office. Okay? Why? Because there's social insurance, housing fund, and individual income tax implications. 
The next question is, well, maybe we can just hire them as freelance consultants. If you do that, and these employees should actually have their own companies in China, where you will then have service agreements and proper invoicing for their time and their services. Now, if these employees don't set up their own companies, you're going into a very great area of freelance agreements, where there is actually no law in China about freelance payments, which is why it's a 50-50 of whether things will work out for you or not. Now, I say all of this because if the employees in China, if they get fired by you and they lose faith, which is a cultural aspect, they can easily go to the labor arbitration committee in China to denounce you. And what that will do is it will impact your future development in China because it could be that you get blacklisted for not properly hiring these individuals in China. And trust me, I've seen that happen, okay? There are employees who get angry. Now you can always gain le leverage, and this is why education is important, and preparing yourself is important, is that you need to be aware that you can go back to them and say, well, I wanna see proof that you've paid your taxes on the salary we paid you through the freelance agreement. I wanna see that you've paid your contribution to social insurance and housing. The majority of cases, they would never have done that. So you will have leverage over them, but you want to make sure to remember to ask that question. Okay. But ultimately, do you really want to get into a legal issue over a guy? Honestly, is that is that your intention? If that's your intention and you're willing to take that risk, by all means, go ahead with freelance agreements. But if you want to avoid spending money out of pocket to fix these types of roadblocks and obstacles, you know, if you want to avoid that, then we have to go the legal way, right? So you do need a legal presence. It doesn't mean that you have to set up an entity yourself in China. I'm going to explain to you what is the solution in order to be able to, to avoid that. Written employment contracts are required. Electronic versions of the contract permissible. So basically in China, um, Employment contracts are a must, okay? So if you've got an employment relationship, you need an employment agreement. If you're having a service relationship, i.e. these freelance contracts or whatever, then you need a service agreement, all right? But you need an agreement, not just oral confirmations and email confirmations. It has to be something legitimately there, okay? And in China, we are still very old fashioned on the ground. Um, original hard copies will want to be seen. So do not rely on DocuSign or any of these electronic versions. Um, please do rely more on, on, uh, on the hard copies. How difficult is it to terminate employees in China? It is extremely difficult. The labor law is highly protective over employees, particularly China. Chinese employees, all right? Which is why it is much better for you to hire people legally through local entities so that you have proper employment contracts in place that are based on PRC law, where they are detailing very clearly termination clauses so that you have the ability to terminate employees. And in addition to that, that there is also an employee handbook outlining the company's bylaws towards breach of contract um, or providing, for example, warning letters for poor performance, whatever it might be, All right? You've got to imagine if you're going to hire somebody in Germany, you're going to make sure you've got a proper employment contract and employee handbook in place so that event eventually if you have to fire them, you have the ability to do so and you're protecting yourself. Remember, the goal here is to protect yourself, as a leader manager going into China and protect your business and to avoid most of the common obstacles and mistakes that are happening, right? So make sure you get these contracts early. Are fixed term employment contracts permissible? Yes. All right. So in China, fixed term agreements are common predominantly because you maybe need more time than the probation period is giving to understand whether an employee has the right synergy with your company and is hitting the right KPIs and targets. 
if you have open-ended contracts, uh, there's nothing wrong with them at all. It just makes it a little bit more trickier on the termination side if you have fixed term agreements. In China, um, an employee that has worked consecutively for a period of no less than 10 years, um, or the employer has signed two fixed term employment contracts, it will then go to an open ended contract. Okay. But by all means, we can start off with a fixed term two year contract, but they can only sign two fixed term contracts. So, for example, one year fixed term, one year fixed term, and then it has to go open ended. <clears throat> Is an employee handbook required? Technically, it's not required at all, but it is strongly recommended, okay? An employee handbook is basically a guideline for employees to understand what the rules are to be working in the public holidays, what are the rules if you work on public holidays, what are the rules for maternity leave, for death in the family, but ultimately also, if you do something wrong and you're human, if you do something wrong, what capabilities does the company have in terms of providing warning letters, um, breach of contract, which may ultimately lead to termination? Remember, when you are terminating in China, it is very difficult to terminate without evidentiary proof. If you don't have the evidentiary proof, you're going to be paying high compensation packages, termination compensation packages. So the employee handbook is something critical that will help in labor disputes. Um, does the Chinese employment law differ from province to province? Yes. Um, very generally, yes. Ultimately, there is an overall China labor law province to province, if not city to city. So, for example, even in Guangdong province, um, you may have differences or, or precedents that exist that is different in Guangzhou than it is in, in Shenzhen. All right. So there are these slight differentiations, but they are really so slight and so minor. But this just leads to the point that it's very good to have a lawyer, a labor lawyer on your speed dial just in case. Now, how do employment matters impact transactions? And I want to say this because you might find that initially you don't set up your own entity in China. You're using a third party to hire individuals or you're signing freelance agreements and you're taking that risk. But eventually you're going to hit certain triggers, which are going to push you to actually establish your own entity in China. So what does that mean in terms of the employment? Okay. That basically means for the employment that these individuals have to sign new employment contracts to move over to the company. The terms and conditions can remain the same, but the actual employer of record will change. Um, so you need to be aware of how that's going to impact your employees, how that's going to impact you in the long term. Is a non-unionized foreign company affected by the local labor unions? Yes, trade unions can definitely influence non-unionized workforce. As a rule of thumb, unions can only be formed in companies that have over 30 employees. It's not mandatory that they're formed at all, but they do have the option to be formed if there are 30 or more employees. Um, and you need to be understand how unions can affect you. Um, if, if they are to be created. And then number nine, ultimately, is the, are there other hiring alternatives besides direct employment? And yes, there are. So there is labor dispatch, there's part-time, there's independent contractor, but that requires them to have their own entity then. And then finally, there's employer record, which is something that I really wanna emphasize for those of you that are uh, not looking to set up their own entities in China. The employer of record service is basically where you want to hire people, but you don't want to set up an entity. Like I said, freelance agreements are a gray area. Um, according to Chinese labor law, mainland Chinese individuals should not be working for overseas entities. Okay? Overseas entities can do what they like, but from Chinese perspective, it's not allowed. So you actually need to hire mainland Chinese employees or foreign employees that are going to be expatriated over through a China registered company, okay? And there are companies where Woodburn 
hires these individuals on your behalf um, in order to be able that they work. So how it works, I'll show you a diagram basically, is where you've got the employee, you've got the client, so you, and then you've got a company that offers the employer of record service. And it's basically a co-employment relationship. From an administrative perspective, the employee is employed by the employer of record. From an operational day-to-day -day perspective, it's between the client, you, and the employee. And then there's a service agreement offering a variety of different services between the client and the employer of record. The advantage of the employer of record is just ease of mind. You know fully well that everything is going smoothly within your organization. You know exactly that this is a fast way of getting into market without having the commitment and the financial need to set up an entity. This is a way for you to get people on the ground to do the, the responsibilities you're looking for them to do um, and for them to then be able to kick off and get the ball rolling, right? So it's a great intermediary service that's being offered, not just by Woodburn, but a variety of different companies out there in China. Now, I do have some clients who use not necessarily licensed employer records, but may use suppliers, may use distributors to actually do the hiring of these employees. All of that is possible, but you just need to make sure that these distributors and suppliers are properly hiring people. I do have a very horrible case study where one employee broke his leg and on the day, I mean, this was 10, 15 years ago. And on the day that he was walking in crutches and, and the foreign investor the client was coming into town, went to the supplier's office, he saw his employee on crutches handing out an envelope, asking for money. He said, what's going on here? And his man says that they can offer, if he can borrow money to cover his medical bills. And lo and behold, what was discovered, the supplier was never paying the social insurance and housing fund. So they were pocketing that money and not properly declaring the employees. So you've really got to make sure you investigate when you're using these types of third parties that they're doing it properly and legally and they're not, not like pocketing and stuff um, uh, for themselves. With a very important point, particularly in COVID times, which is helping your new employees to settle in, okay? We have gone through this whole tedious task of understanding the characteristics of who we wanna hire, finding people through a variety of different platforms, going through the painful task of doing video conferences and doing many of them to find the last five that we're looking for. We've gone through the legal aspects of how to hire these people as well. You can't now just hire them and forget about them. And that's what a lot of companies do, right? Particularly during COVID times. You cannot just put all the responsibilities on their shoulders and say, okay, I expect the KPIs to be achieved within the next six months. No, there's going to have to be continuous support between the head office and these employees to achieve those goals. And like I've said many times during the last few presentations, it is really important that you look at your time resources to be able to progress in China. So always remember that the hiring process does not end on your new employee's first day. It's not mission accomplished. You have to make sure that they successfully complete the probation period and they truly have the vision of, of scaling up your company, okay? Settling into a company takes time, all right? Um, you have to understand that as a new expatriate residing in China or as a local Chinese employee that has never worked for a foreign investor before, it takes time to settle in any new company. You have to build your ecosystem internally, you know who to report to and how things work. Okay? It's not surprising that some employment experts believe that it can take over a year for a new employee to be fully productive in China. So I want people to be aware of that. Okay? Um, and which is why sometimes it's good to have a fixed term contract that's the least again. Of course, you'll want your new start to be performing. There's no question on that, but you have to make sure you give them training, guidance, support, particularly in the early stages, okay? The biggest challenge you will find will not be the interview process and all of that. It'll be hiring them and keeping them, maintaining them, 
making sure that they stay on board and don't drift off to another company. Right? This is fundamental. So the conclusion that I just want to set here today is that it, you have to set very clear and realistic goals where you need to be in three to five years and act on them. Okay. Strong goals will help you to focus your energy on the team and keep your fluctuation low. That which basically means you're developing loyalty and trust amongst your team members. You have to have a clear strategy. You have to develop habits of being sure that communication is there on a daily, weekly basis, that you understand and have clear outlines and guidelines for the team on the ground. And don't forget that somebody needs to build a bridge between the HQ and China, and your first hires are going to be building that bridge. So we want you all to be aware of that. Make one person in the HQ responsible. Um, that makes it a lot easier for communication. Ensure that you're committed. Um, from what I've seen, phishing doesn't work very well in the Chinese market. And if your organization is in China and isn't producing results, you really need to act now. Okay? It is the single largest market on the planet. And if your team is not producing results at the speed that you want them to, change the team. Don't wait and hope that they're going to do what you want them to do. Um, I love this quote from Warren Buffett, which is, no matter how great the talents or efforts, some things just take time. You can't produce a baby in one month by getting nine women pregnant. All right? I love that end quote. Um, you can't produce your China baby in one month. It might take a couple of years for you to see the results. So you do have to develop patience for the market. And again, you have to build trust and loyalty with these first hires that you're going to have on the ground. Always think about the communication and always think, is there continuous synergy between the two of you? Are they believers? Are they, are they still with the vision of what you want to create? So I'd love to hear what your biggest takeaway from today was. If you give me one word, um, especially if you're watching this on replay, don't hesitate to let me know what your feedback is. How you can work with us on this topic is that we offer recruitment services, particularly in finance roles. We also offer employer record services. We can provide templates for employment agreements and handbooks, and we can also provide payroll simulations, breakdowns for social insurance and housing fund, if that is needed too. Um, no questions have popped in thus far. Um, but uh, if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. If you're interested in hiring new employees in China and you want to get an understanding of how to recruit them or how to hire them, um, then just email me at christina at woodburnglobal.com and I'd be happy to support you on this exciting new step of, of actually getting people on the ground and building the team locally. I want to thank you all for joining me for session four. If you're interested in joining me for tomorrow's session, which is on corporate management, you can go to woodburnglobal.com slash events um, and register there. I look forward to seeing you then. Take care and goodbye.